we've studied Tanzania as an example of a country trying to become food secure. For a country to become food secure, there needs to be enough food available in terms of calorific value. That food needs to be affordable and that food needs to be varied enough so that people have got a healthy, nutritious diet. Tanzania is a, is a country located in southern Africa. It's got a population of around 51 million and growing fast. And most of those people live in rural areas. Although its biggest city, Dar es Salaam on the coast, has got 5 million people. So is food affordable in Tanzania? Well, the evidence would suggest that a lot of people are in severe poverty. Going back to 1992, 72% of the population living on less than $1.25 a day. This has improved over the years, but even in 2012, nearly 44% of people were living on less than $1.25 a day. This would suggest that the average person doesn't have the money to be able to afford a balanced, nutritious, healthy diet. Is there enough food available for, in Tanzania, and is it nutritious and healthy? Well, the population has continued to increase quite rapidly. Now, this increases the demand for food. Furthermore, the climate of Tanzania suffers from a dry season, and in some years it suffered from serious droughts. This has meant that the supply can't keep up with the demand, and so the average number of calories eaten is around 2,137, whereas the average male would need more like 2,500. As a result of this, it's classed as seriously uh, undernourished on the Global hung Hunger Index. In fact, 35% of people in Tanzania are classed as undernourished. So in Tanzania, we looked at some case studies of attempts to achieve food security. The first we looked at was a past attempt to achieve food security at a local scale. So we looked at the example of Gote. This was a bottom-up strategy because it was based in villages. It was community-led. And Goat Aid was run by a charity, a UK charity, called Farm Africa. Farm Africa invested £200,000 in goats, um, but this was on a loan basis. So the farmers would eventually have to pay back the money. And villages were given goats on loan, which that they could then use to farm. The area of Tanzania that was targeted was in the north, an area called the Babati region. And so Farm Africa imported Toggenberg goats, which can cope with the quite dry conditions, at a cost of £400 per goat. For the exam, we need to be able to evaluate the success of goat aid for achieving food security in Tanzania. On the positive side, goats provide meat, milk, around three litres per day per goat, and cheese. And so this adds nutrition to a diet. For example, meat provides protein and iron. The milk can provide calcium and this can allow, for example, children to grow up healthier and stronger. Produce such as cheese can also be sold for the farmer to earn more money. The manure from the goat is actually a good fertilizer and this enabled villages to improve their growing of other crops. The goats breed up to six goats per pair per year and so over time the farmer can sell the goats that they don't need for profit. Overall, the goat aid farmers made more profit than non-goat aid farmers. And this benefited these farmers because some were able to send their children to school even after paying for various vet bills of looking after the goats. On the negative side, this project was uh, bottom up. So it only benefited the few villages that Farm Africa worked with and not the whole of Tanzania. The vet bills were expensive. The goats were on loan and so the cost had to be paid back. Finally, the goats need lots of water and eat lots of grass. And actually, this could be a problem in a country that suffers from droughts. Now looking at our second case study, we looked at a past attempt to achieve food security at a national scale. And so we looked at the Tanzania Canada Wheat Programme. This was a top-down government-led strategy. The Tanzanian president argued that Tanzania should grow their own food, and so the need for food security was clear after a drought in 1973 to 1975. 
At this time, Tanzania had to rely on other countries to provide emergency food aid. And so Tanzania's president asked Canada for help with growing wheat, as Canada had a lot of expertise at growing huge amounts of wheat. And so between 1968 and 1993, Canada provided $95 million in aid. This money provided suitable wheat seeds, machinery like tractors, chemical fertilizers, and training for the local people. Let's now evaluate whether the Tanzania Canada Wheat Programme was successful in achieving food security. Well, on the positives, Tanzania did produce a lot more wheat than previously. Around 400 jobs were created for people working on the large farms. Road and rail and electricity infrastructure were all improved. Were all improved. In the 1992 drought, Tanzania was the only country in southern Africa not to rely on emergency food aid from other countries, largely because Tanzania had managed to produce so much wheat. On the negative side, the semi-nomadic Barabaig, a traditional tribe of about 40,000 people, had been using the lands for many years to graze their cattle. And unfortunately, they were forced off their grazing lands, sometimes with violence, to make way for these large wheat fields. With just one crop being grown, wheat, biodiversity was lost, and so, over time, soil fertility got worse and worse. In fact, it would have been cheaper overall to buy in the wheat rather than trying to grow it in Tanzania's fairly dry climate. For such a big, expensive project, 400 jobs is not many jobs created. Over time, as the machinery started to become older, Tanzania had to buy spare machine parts from Canada, and so this benefited Canada and not Tanzania. Often those spare parts were too expensive. Moving on to the present, the fact that the Canada Wheat Programme was stopped in 1993 is evidence that it wasn't achieving that aim of food security for Tanzania. And so looking to the future, we now have a project called the SAGCOT Programme operating. SAGCOT stands for the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania. And this project began in 2010. And it aims to improve farming along a growth corridor of fertile land and good soil stretching from Dar es Salaam on the coast across the country. This is a big government-led project and the government from, of Tanzania along with foreign investors like China and TNCs have invested millions of dollars. In fact over a billion dollars have been invested in improving things like the roads, the railways and the water supply for irrigation. Large commercial palm farms have been set up and this project has connected these large farms back to Dar es Salaam and it's also connected these large farms to many surrounding smaller farms. And this means that those smaller farms can get support from the large farms, for example, by borrowing bits of machinery when they need it. So is the SAGCOT program finally the way that Tanzania can achieve food security? Well, let's evaluate its progress so far. On the positives, the better transport has meant food is quickly transported to markets like in Dar es Salaam. And so this means less food is wasted and is spoiled, and therefore more profit can go to the farmers. 75,000 small farms have been better linked to markets through the improved infrastructure. Improved irrigation means that farmers can grow year round, even in the dry season. 450,000 jobs have been created, and 2 million people have been lifted out of poverty. As the small farms have been supported, this has led to a greater variety of crops being grown. Contrast that back with the Canada Wheat Programme. One particular success story is the Colombera Plantation. This is a large commercial farm that grows rice. So since the SAGCOT Programme began, it's doubled its rice yield. 7,300 other rice farmers in the area from 11 villages have also increased their production because they've been able to get that support from the large commercial farm and benefit from the improved infrastructure so they can get their rice to markets more easily. On the negative side, you could say that most of the money invested has benefited these large commercial farms rather than the smaller farms run by ordinary Tanzanians. And so smaller farm owners have had little control over the decisions. Similar to the Canada Wheat Programme, some nomadic tribes have lost access to the water 
due to the large irrigation projects created by the large farms. Foreign investors such as China arguably will benefit the most. For example, the Kilombero project has provided lots of cheap rice that will be eaten in China and not Tanzania. So this project is still going and so it remains to be seen if this will truly allow sustainable food security in Tanzania.